Welcome to the Be Well at USAS podcast with me, Tracy Spencer. I am a white female born in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and my pronouns are she and her. I am the manager of the student affairs and outreach team here at the University of Saskatchewan. In each episode, members of the USASC and wider community will join us in sharing ideas and providing guidance on all aspects of being well. And we'll be highlighting campus initiatives and resources designed to engage and support you. In these challenging times, we hope the ideas and information that we share will help. In this special episode, which coincides with Sexual Violence Awareness Week at the university, we are going to be discussing sexualized violence and what prevention efforts we can all do in preventing and addressing sexual violence on our campus and in our community. I have two special guests joining me for this episode, Tasneem Jaisi, who is the coordinator of the USSU Women's Center, and Brittany Thiessen, a graduate student researching sexual violence prevention and interventions. Welcome to the podcast, Tasneem and Brittany. I am so grateful that you were able to join me today. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Let's start with each of you telling our listeners a little bit about yourself and why you are passionate about sexual violence prevention. My name is Tasneem Jaisi. I use she, her pronouns, and I identify as a Desi disabled woman. Growing up with this identity, intersectional feminism has been one of the strongest pillars of support for me. This movement has allowed me to find my voice and speak up against injustices directed at myself and marginalized communities around me. I believe that it is important to be able to learn and help educate one another about our lived experiences as we continue striving towards a more inclusive future. I myself have had faced issues of sexual violence growing up and saw many close friends, family, and community members dealing with this issue without having the right resources and information to take action against it. I want to create an environment where we don't have to feel like that anymore about sexual violence. At USASC, I am currently studying political studies and women's and gender studies. I currently work as the USSU Women's Center Coordinator. At the center, our goal is to essentially create a safe, comfortable, and positive space to organize around feminism and activism. Additionally, we are a pro-choice organization. We exist to educate and inform the campus community about issues that are affecting women to overall promote equality while recognizing and celebrating differences within the diverse and dynamic USAS campus. Thanks, Tasneem. Brittany? Uh, Yeah, so my name is Brittany. Um, I'm a white woman uh, born and raised in Saskatchewan. So uh, my experiences really do relate to growing up and living in this province and city. Um, My pronouns are she, her. As Tracy said, I'm a graduate student in applied social psychology, and my research focuses on sexual violence prevention and interventions. Um, But I actually started researching sexual violence interventions in my undergrad. I I was always interested in sexual violence um, as a research area, but initially I thought I was going to focus um, more on the forensic psychology side of sexual violence. However, in my undergrad, I was able to take a human sexuality class taught by Dr. Lindsay Williamson, and it was the first time I received really any sort of good sexual health education uh, she she taught us about consent and rape myths and, you know, sexual violence in general and just all these topics that I had never really learned about until that point in time, which is kind of disappointing. But anyways, um, so everything I learned in that class really made me question how I saw the world around me. And I, I began to think about past instances uh, where sexual violence had happened around me and I didn't do anything to intervene or where I had reacted really poorly when someone disclosed to me. And I began to question why I didn't intervene and why I reacted those ways. And I kept thinking how, like myself, and I think really a lot of other people would react so differently if we had any education on sexual violence. So after I started considering these issues, uh, the Me Too movement went viral. 
and the issue of sexual violence was really brought to the forefront of international discussion. And at that point, I really became interested in researching um, how sexual violence prevention education could help to change people's attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors around sexual violence. Um, and it just so happened that my, my master's program actually included an internship component. And so this past year, um, I, I had the opportunity to work with Student Affairs and Outreach to um, help develop a sexual violence prevention course as part of my internship, uh, which has really been a dream. So, so that's been great. Well, we have certainly been very excited to have you on board, Brittany. So you mentioned the Me Too movement. And so let's start there. Uh, so the hashtag Me Too movement was created by activist Tarana Burke in 2006. And she created the movement to help survivors of sexual violence by building a community of survivor-driven advocates who could really be at the front lines of disrupting sexual violence. In 2017, the hashtag MeToo movement was brought to the forefront again when actress Alyssa Milano tweeted, if all women who have been sexually harassed or assaulted wrote Me Too as a status, we might give people a sense of the magnitude of the problem. Milano's tweet went viral and many people shared their stories of sexual violence with the hashtag MeToo. So... Tasneem, tell me, how did the hashtag MeToo movement impact you? The MeToo movement had a huge impact on me and my work because it was the first time in my life that I started to question the stigmas and shame survivors and victims received surrounding the topic of sexual violence. These messages that I received growing up was so much about convincing me and those around me that sexual violence is the norm and that it was just a part of life because everyone I talked to or somebody that they knew seemed to have an, had an experience with sexual violence. It was a matter of having to re-educate myself and relearn that the sexual violence that I received and the community and friends around me received, it was not okay. And sexual violence is not just a part of life. Perpetrators of sexual violence choose to commit these horrific acts and they must be held accountable for. The Me Too movement gave me the language that I was not familiar with about sexual violence and led the communities that I belong to understand that we were not alone in our experiences. Thank you, Tasneem. Brittany, how did the hashtag MeToo movement impact you? Yeah, um, I'm actually going to go off a little bit what what Tazneem just said, where um, she was talking about, you know, how how we've kind of been led to believe that sexual violence is the norm, and I think that's particularly true of sexual harassment. Um, and I and I think that was, you know, a moment of clarity for me, I guess. Uh, when the Me Too movement went viral was that, you know, all these people were sharing stories of sexual harassment. And um, I think being harassed had been like so normalized to me, um, you know, such a part of daily life that I had never really thought about, you know, um, why I dressed a certain way when I was, you know, having to walk downtown. Like I, I didn't want to draw attention to myself or um, you know, why, why I hold my, my keys, you know, between my fingers, just, you know, just in case, you know, someone jumped out at me or whatever. Um, and <laughs> I was thinking, you know, like, why do I do those things? And, and it was really like a real moment of awareness when I was like, you know, a lot of women, actually, I think most women do those things. Um, and we shouldn't have to. Um, so I think, you know, the Me Too movement really, um, brought those issues to the forefront forefront because I, I think you know it's so normalized that we just we just accept that's the way that things are um, but that they shouldn't be and you know the me too movement just shared the the sheer enormity of people that that do those things to protect themselves on a daily basis mm-hmm. um, so yeah that I, I totally agree with you know what Tazim is saying but um, as I said before I, I was interested in researching sexual violence you know bef- even before the me too movement went viral. Um, But when it did go viral, it really made me feel like, you know, our work on this issue is, you know, very timely and very needed. Um, You know, so many people engage with the Me Too hashtag. And I think that really just drew attention to the prevalence of sexual violence. And people really started to think, you know, like, okay, you know, it's, it's time. We need to really focus on doing something. 
I I couldn't agree with both of you more. And I I would just say that social media movements like hashtag Me Too did help to bring down the isolation and the stigma that surrounds sexual violence and and really gave people a platform and a voice to speak up and ask for help. It also drew further attention to the fact that sexual violence remains a significant issue within our community. So let's talk about what sexual violence means. Brittany, can you describe for us what we mean when we talk about sexual violence? Yeah, so I think the terminology, you know, it has changed a little bit and we moved away from just using the term sexual assault and instead we use the term sexual violence now. So the reason for that is to recognize uh, that there's, you know, a real multitude of actions that are, are not necessarily assault, but that are still sexually violent. So basically, sexual violence is an umbrella term that encompasses sexual assault, but it also includes um, things like sexual harassment and sexual abuse. So in bystander training, we talk about sexual violence um, along a continuum. So at the bottom of the continuum is sexual harassment, and at the top of the continuum is, you know, sexual assault. So sexual assault happens less frequently, but is more recognized as problematic by, by our society, I would say. Uh, whereas sexual harassment actually happens more frequently, but it's, it's less recognized as something that's problematic. You know, like, as I was saying, sexual harassment is so normalized. I just accept it as part of my daily life and, and not something that I would react against, right? Um, so, you know, it's, it's really something that's not recognized as problematic, um, but the problem with that is that, you know, these actions at the bottom of the continuum, um, you know, like sexual harassment, uh, it just serves to normalize and justify sexual assault. So, you know, if we really want to tackle the issues that are considered really problematic by society, you know, like like sexual assault or rape, um, we really need to start tackling those issues at the bottom of the continuum, like like sexual harassment as well. You you mentioned a really good point, Brittany, that understanding sexual harassment is so important as it normalizes and justifies sexual violence. So can you share some examples of what sexual harassment is? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, like things like being catcalled, uh, you know, maybe someone's following you a little bit too closely. Um they're staring at you at the gym and they're not looking away and it's, you know, it's been a long time. Um, you're, you're being whistled at, um, you know, even things like, like rape jokes, you know, those are things you kind of hear and you're like, Oh, you know, it's, it's not a big deal. I'll just laugh and, and whatever. But, um, you know, laughing at those things, you know, what, what does that really communicate? You know, you're just by laughing, you're, you're saying it's funny. Right. And, and why is, why is rape funny? It's not. So you can see you're just, by laughing, you're kind of creating that environment where things like physical sexual assault are, are accepted almost, right? Also, sexual harassment can include things like um, in in relationships, like, you know, being pressured to go out with someone, you know, after, after you've turned them down like a few times, like, like that's harassing behavior or, you know, being pressured for sex if you're in a relationship with somebody or, or with a partner or whatever. Um, so it, it really includes, you know, a lot of behaviors that are harmful. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like behaviors both um, with people you don't know, but also with individuals that you may have some sort of a relationship with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's also really important to remember that it is not the intent behind the action that matters. It's how the action makes another person feel, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, a lot of people think, you know, maybe they're rubbing your shoulders or something and like that's like well-intentioned or whatever, but, um, and you know, like they don't mean any harm, but that could be really uncomfortable for somebody. Like mm -hmm. you don't, you don't know how, how that person is feeling about that. So I think, you know, we really need to be conscious of, of people's space and, and how they are feeling about the action. You know, it's, it's not, it's not your intention, but it, yeah, it's, it's how the other person feels about it. Absolutely. So, Let's talk about the prevalence of sexual violence within Canada. Can the two of you tell us a little bit about um, how significant this issue is within our community? Yeah, so sexual violence is like still quite prevalent in Canada. I believe it's like one in one in three or four women experience sexual violence, one in six men experience sexual assault. So, um, yeah, pretty prevalent. Uh, in fact, you know, reporting rates actually 
increased about 13% uh, following the Me Too movement. So that was in 2017. Um, not sure if it was because of the Me Too movement specifically, but it, it did follow the Me Too movement that we saw this increase. But in particular, we do know that, you know, marginalized groups really experience quite high rates of sexual violence. So, for example, you know, those that identify as lesbian, gay or bisexual experience sexual assault at a rate six times higher than those who identify as heterosexual. Six mm. times. Like, that's a lot. Wow. Um, you know, those with mental or physical disabilities experience sexual violence at a rate two times higher than those with no disability. Um, and Indigenous individuals experience sexual assault at a rate three times higher uh, than non-Indigenous individuals. So we can really see that marginalized groups do do experience high rates, high rates of sexual violence, and those rates are even higher if it's a marginalized woman. So um, I think it's, it's really important that we, we talk about that. Um, however, there are some marginalized groups that have really been left out of the research in Canada, such as you know, transgender individuals, um, black people, and other people of color. Uh, where we don't really know what the rates are for for those people across Canada, and uh, that was that was something Tasneem raised uh, that I think was really important when we were working together. Um, and how did you put that, Tasneem? So I think the lack of statistics in Canada regarding so many marginalized communities and their experiences with sexual violence really works to erase their experiences and not allow for resource allocations to these communities that need it. And so we can't solve these problems surrounding sexual violence if they're not being accurately accounted for. We can't tackle the issue if we don't know what the problem is by not having enough resources to work with these communities. We are letting marginalized demographics down every day when we don't have access to these statistics to properly dismantle the barriers that are affecting them. Yeah, like I totally agree with that. I think it's really important that we have these statistics. Um, you'll know that if you're if you are in sexual violence research, um, that having that evidence is, or those statistics, is really how we ground the importance of programs and how how we fight for change is like by knowing those numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so not so not knowing them is really an important issue, and and it does it does leave people behind. Yeah. So it sounds like we have a lot more to do in yeah. regards to gathering statistics for marginalized groups and for so many. So let's talk about in a previous episode with Heaven Berhey, she talked about the theory of intersectionality and how it relates to discrimination. Tasneem, can you share with us how intersectionality relates to sexual violence prevention and intervention? Yeah, for sure. So intersectionality was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, this concept highlights how different layers of someone's identity, such as race, class, and gender, leads people to face different types of hardships and oppression. We need to take a look at the issues of marginalized communities in a multidimensional way. We need to understand that it is human-made and systematic forms of discrimination that are tied to certain identities, and this is what intersectionality tries to examine. When we understand how various layers of someone's identity is having a certain effect on someone's lived experiences, we're able to better understand and, and uncover what we need to bring awareness to in order to fixing these issues. When it comes to the topic of intersectionality in relation to survivors and victims of sexual violence, we need to keep in mind that societal stereotypes and biases end up erasing the lived experiences of many of these marginalized community members. This cycle of oppression and vulnerability constantly works to silence marginalized voices and forms of communication when people from these demographics are needing support. Mm. So how does intersectionality relate to privilege and oppression? Privilege can be tied to certain identities of people that can hold a lot of power. For example, a white middle-class cisgender man 
does hold a lot of societal powers. People who hold certain privileges can for sure utilize their privileges by firstly recognizing their privileges and then using their privileges to amplify the voices of marginalized communities. I think here I can speak a little bit from my individual experiences to explain this topic further, as I myself have aspects of my identity that allow me to be privileged and unprivileged. And so just a disclaimer, these are just my personal experiences. And even if someone has similar aspects of identities that they share with me, we are all unique in what we experience. So in the beginning of this conversation, I stated that I was a Desi disabled woman. With these With these aspects of my identity, I am oppressed by racism, ableism, and sexism, a triple stigmatized identity. How society and the status quo works is that these identities of mine oppress me systematically every day of my life. But at the same time, I grew up in a middle-class household with a straight sexuality, I did not have the live I do not have the lived experiences for example of a queer individual my family's class status allowed me privileges such as being able to pursue a post secondary education using the example of my lived experiences what i have described is the multilayered analysis that intersectionality tries to identify with within the realms of privilege and oppression of individual experiences By understanding how these different identities of an individual works to place certain social markers on them can help us identify what systems hold them back or give them a push forward. Thank you so much, Tasneem, for sharing your personal experience with us. And it's a great segue into the next question, which... So we know that sexual violence is a significant issue within our community, but statistics show that sexual violence is underreported. Brittany, what do you see as some of the barriers to people reporting sexual violence? Um, Yeah, so really only one in every 20 sexual assaults is reported to police. So that's, that's not, that's not a lot. Um, And and you said barriers to reporting, but I really think that there are barriers to even just telling anyone what happened. So not even not even just reporting, like reporting is like an extra an extra leap. So um, there's there's so many barriers that I could discuss, but I think rape myths or victim blaming is a really big barrier. Um, and this barrier really affects not only how a victim or a survivor uh, contextualizes what happened to them, uh, but also how anyone they tell may contextualize what happened to the victim or the survivor. Um, so for those of you that don't know, a rape myth is a myth about sexual assault that works to place the blame on the victim while removing the blame from the perpetrator. So an example of a rape myth could be like, you know, they were drinking way too much that night. Like, what did they think was going to happen? So I'm going to throw it back to Dr. Williamson again, um, who taught that human sexuality class. That was great um, because she showed our class this sh- this clip. And basically in the clip, they compare sexual assault to a murder. Um, so the clip goes, you know, oh, James, uh, James is wearing such a deep V-neck T-shirt. You know, it made sense that someone would stab them in the chest. Or James was such a friendly, chatty person. They, they talked to everyone. They liked they liked talking to everyone. Um, it made sense that they were going to come across a murderer eventually. And, you know, (laughs) when we think about, when we put it that way, it sounds like really quite ridiculous. But those are the types of justifications people make for why sexual assault happens. Uh, They make those similar sorts of, sorts of statements or they say similar things, right? Um, So if you're a victim or a survivor and you've heard people make those justifications or, or maybe you have internalize those beliefs yourself, it makes a lot of sense that you wouldn't want to tell anybody what happened. You know, especially if the assault included any of those factors that people do use when they're when they're trying to justify a sexual assault. I also think that how we understand consent and, and what sexual violence is also plays a big role in whether we're willing to uh, disclose or to report. And I think popular media has done this unfortunately, a really good job of placing this image in our mind of how sexual assault happens and, and really what it should look like. 
even also when we're looking at consent, you know, uh, popular media also depicts consent happening, you know, non-verbally and that the things are just supposed to flow together and, you know, no one really has to say anything. And it's not what practicing affirmative consent should look like. But back to this uh, portrayal of popular media, um, sexual assault portrayals in popular media. I'm thinking about those crime shows where, you know, a woman in her 20s is walking alone in a dark parking lot at night. Uh, so in these depictions, you know, the victim is almost always a woman. The perpetrator is almost always a male that's a stranger. And there's usually physical violence involved. And, you know, in reality, majority of sexual assaults don't happen that way. But having the schema in our mind can make reporting and even disclosing sexual assault really hard, you know, especially when the assault doesn't fit that narrative that we have in our mind. So, for example, uh, myself being a woman, you know, if another woman sexually assaulted me, that might be really hard for me to report because, you know, there's this narrative that women don't commit sexual assault, that only men do. Um, but in reality, you know, anyone can commit sexual assault. You know, another example is sexual assault often occurs within intimate relationships. And because the perpetrator is not a stranger in that case, you know, that person might feel like they wouldn't be believed by their friend or by law enforcement or the university, for example, because the person that assaulted them is an intimate partner. You know, we really all do have a role and a part to play in preventing and responding to sexual violence. And so what are some of the ways we can help prevent and respond to sexual violence on our campus? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, so, you know, as I said before, I really think that education is is so key. It was so key for me. Um, so really seeking out that education. Um, and like I said, the university, uh, you know, has been working on um, a sexual violence prevention course. So in recent months, you know, we've been working to develop a series of online learning modules um, as part of the next phase of the university's sexual violence prevention and response work. And, you know, a lot of really great people have collaborated um, on these modules. Um, it's really been, a, I think, a community effort. You know, students, staff and faculty have have all, you know, consulted on them. So that's that's really amazing. So some of the content is specific to students and other elements have been designed specifically with faculty and staff members in mind. So, you know, situations, you know, more specific to their experiences. There's four modules in total. So the first is titled, uh, What is Sexual Violence? So this module is designed to increase your knowledge about what we mean when we use that term, uh, the context in which sexual violence can occur. You know, as I said before, it's it's not, it doesn't really match that schema that we have in our mind a lot of the time. It's, it's good to know, you know, some of the, some of the statistics that are out there um, and uh, some key facts about its prevalence. Um, the second module has uh, two parallel pieces. Uh, so for faculty and staff, there's a consent and power in relationships module. And there's also a parallel consent module uh, with content that's designed specifically for students. So both of those modules are designed to help you understand power dynamics within different relationships, um, especially those that you know exist in our post-secondary context. And uh, what we mean when we use the word consent and, you know, how to actually practice that in your own relationships. Um, the third module focuses on bystander intervention. Um, and that one shares strategies for, you know, being a pro-social bystander uh, to safely intervene in situations to prevent and respond to sexual violence. Uh, and there's a final module uh, that I'll let Tracy talk about. Yeah, so the final module is responding to disclosures of sexual violence. So this content is designed to improve your knowledge and your skills to be able to support survivors of sexual violence. Uh, we know how important it is for survivors to receive caring and compassionate responses from the people around them, as these responses really do set the stage for the healing process and can help prevent or lessen trauma. So very excited about these modules to come out. Brittany, how long are each of the modules and are, are there interactive components? Yeah, so each of the modules, I would say would take around only, you know, 30 to 45 minutes, probably at the very high end to complete. 
Um, so the great thing about them is you can kind of stop and start at your own pace. So, you, you know, you might want to do one at a time or something like that. So um, they're really built so that you can um, learn learn the way you want to learn at your own speed. And there are interactive components. You know, we've been we've been sure to include, you know, little videos, YouTube videos from you know, great creators, you know, that one clip I talked about earlier is, is in the first module. So I encourage you to watch that one. Is that, um, and there's also, yes, that's the James is dead. And I I think that's a really great video and it's, it's, you know, it's a little bit humorous, but it really, um, I think challenges your thinking a little bit around rape myths, especially. So I, I really encourage people to watch that one. Um, you know, there's also, you know, little quizzes to check your understanding, you know, and little, you know, interactive glossaries and those sorts of things. Um, so we, we tried to make it as, as fun as can be so that it's, you know, it is an interactive experience for you. That sounds fantastic. And I know I've been part of it with you as we've been developing it. And I'm really excited for, for people to be able to um, take the modules. Where are people going to be able to find the modules and when? Big question. When? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. So we're hoping for a soft launch during Sexual Violence Awareness Week, um, which I think Tasneem will share a little bit about with us right away here. Um, But you can also find them. We're planning that you'll be able to find them on the university's new management system, uh, Canvas. Fantastic. Thanks, Brittany. Um, I'm really looking forward to people being able to participate and um, take the learning modules. I think it'll be really great. Tasneem, you have something else that you want to share in regards to prevention of sexual violence on our campus. Yeah. So I think, as we have discussed today, like it's important that the University of Saskatchewan is able to deliver necessary sexual violence prevention resources to students. Discussions surrounding sexual violence needs to be accessible and adapted towards individual needs. So from the Women's Center's work, um, our first event of the year will be Sexual Violence Awareness Week, in short, SVAW. So a bit of background detail is that we used to call this event Sexual Assault Awareness Week. And starting this year, we have chosen to change the name to Sexual Violence Awareness Week in order to create a wider space to talk about sexual assault, sexual violence, and sexual abuse. The aim of this event is to continue making sure students are aware and educated on the topic of sexual violence and know that there are resources available to them and that they are not alone. From the Women's Center, our message will always be that we believe survivors and victims of sexual violence, and we are actively seeking the best ways to be there for students and give them the necessary resources of to those students who have lived experiences of sexual violence. For SVAW this year, the main component of this week will be an online speaker series that will be carried out through Zoom. This event will take place during September 21st to September 25th. Each day at 2 p.m., a speaker or speakers, depending on the day, will be discussing a specific theme of the day during the week. These themes will include recognizing sexual violence, understanding consent, trauma recovery, speaking up, and bringing justice. We'll be having speakers from local organizations and university-affiliated organizations. Our speakers will include Saskatoon Sexual Assault and Information Center, Saskatoon Sexual Health, Student Wellness Center, Student Affairs and Outreach, Out Saskatoon, Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission, and Shepherd and Millar Law Office. We are hoping to have a large turnout for this event, with the main target audience being students in general at USASC. However, gaining the attention of the general university community will is always looked forward to. Sounds like this is going to be a pretty amazing week, uh, Tasneem. Thank you for, for all your work in regards to Sexual Violence Awareness Week. That's fun. It's just fantastic. Thank you. 
Uh, so um, that is bringing us to the end of our special podcast. But before we wrap up, I just want to ask my guests, is there any final thought you want to leave our listeners with regarding sexual violence? Um, I can start. So when it comes to understanding sexual violence, we need to realize that our actions either contribute to this issue or puts a stop to this issue. And so being a bystander is being a part of the problem. I think we all can continue to learn to be better allies to survivors and victims of sexual violence. And it starts from calling out harmful jokes that contribute to sexual violence to stopping an act of sexual violence itself. Thanks, Tasneem. Brittany? Uh, yeah, so I just think, uh, you know, seeking out education um, is really so, so important um, on sexual violence. Um, I, I feel like there's always more that you can learn. I'm still learning. There's this quote going around social media that says, normalize changing your opinion when you're presented with new information. Um, and I, I think that's really great because I think there's, you know, there's a lot of space to change our attitudes about these issues. Um, you know, if you kind of had harmful beliefs before, um, and, and that's a really great thing. And like Tasneem said, just, um, learning how to be a better ally, um, really, I think comes from that education. So I would, I would really encourage people to, you know, seek out more education on sexual violence and issues related to that. Thank you. I think for me, I would just say for any survivors of sexual violence, you're not alone. We see you and we are here for you. And for those who receive disclosures, remember some key phrases. I believe you. It's not your fault. And how can I help? Survivors need our support and compassion. So... Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me, Tasneem and Brittany. It means so much to me that, that you are here talking about this really important issue. And I, I look forward to the modules and to Sexual Violence Awareness Week. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. This was, this was a great chat. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for listening to this special episode of the Be Well at USAS podcast with me, Tracy Spencer. And thanks again to Tasneem and Brittany for joining me and sharing their really significant, important information. For those who are victims, survivors of sexual violence, you can contact the Student Affairs and Outreach Team by calling 306-966-5757 or emailing us at student.outreach at usask.ca. You can also connect with or reach out to the Student Wellness Centre, the Saskatoon Sexual Assault and Information Centre, Protective Services, the USSU Pride Centre, and or the USSU Women's Centre. But whatever you do, please reach out. You can also follow the USSU Women's Centre on Instagram or Facebook, and the links will be provided in the podcast details. Check in again for further episodes and more content related to being well. Please subscribe and share this podcast. You can find us on multiple platforms, including Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. We'd also love to hear from you. Please post comments and questions, and we'll look to include them in future episodes. Also, if there's someone you'd like to see as a guest or a topic you'd like us to cover or even a reaction to an episode you want to share, please write to us at bewell.podcast at usask.ca. Until next time, stay safe and be well.